Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Nathan Meehan on energy transition, the next step to net zero. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience. So I'm going to share some polling questions. The first question is, what's your primary discipline? Like we have a lot of petroleum engineers and geoscientists in the audience, new facility engineers, a few in the other category, no petrophysicists yet. So most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close this poll and share the results. Now we're pretty evenly split, split between petroleum engineers and geoscientists. Uh, followed up by other and facility engineers. So our next poll is how many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas business? So it looks like we have a good distribution in our demographics of experience here. Quite a few with over 30 years, but some in every other category. So most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close and share the results. We have 43% with over 30 years. Uh, very close, the 1 to 10 and the 11 to 20, and then a few in the category of less than 1 uh, between 21 and 30 years. So, uh, before I introduce Nathan, I would like to remind our audience that today you will be muted, but you can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation, and you will be anonymous. And I'm going to pull up the slides that we're rolling just to uh, use them for the introduction. This is the energy transition, the next step to net, net zero. Uh, Dr. Meehan has a very extensive resume. I won't read all of this, but you can see that currently he's president of CMG Petroleum Consulting and senior technical advisor for Petro AI. He has an undergraduate from Georgia Tech, a master's from OU, and a PhD from Stanford. He's an SP honorary member and has received numerous awards and serves on several boards as well as advisory boards for a number of universities. And he's a widely published author and a licensed professional engineer in four states. Nathan Meehan teaches for SCA the class Energy Transition for Petroleum Professionals. This will be offered in the live online format in May, so that's six half days in the mornings in uh, uh, Central Time, uh, May 10th through 12th and 18th through 20th. It's offered virt virtually, so you can participate from anywhere around the world. And uh, he'll be touching on some of the elements of that class in his presentation today. And for those of you who are attending today's webinar, write down this discount code, uh, GTW, stands for Go to Webinar 20. And if you register for Dr. Meehan's class by the end of the month, you'll get a 20% discount. So that's just a couple of weeks away. So put it on your calendar and please register. Uh, we have several other free webinars coming up to highlight some of the classes that we offer. Um, we have Eric Carlson who'll be talking about his Big Ben field trip. This is one of numerous geologic field trips that SCA offers, and he'll be talking about normal faulting at Santa Elena Canyon on April 8th. And then uh, we have Larry Lake and Jerry Jensen presenting a webinar on small data plus simple model equals big data. So we look forward to that. And of course, think of SCA, when you're thinking about not only training, but consulting, direct hire, and projects and studies. So I'm going to pass the uh, presentation rights over to Nathan, 
think it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I, this is my first uh, thing I've done formally with SCA, although I go back to really the founding days of SCA. The late uh, Dan Tierpock was not only a close personal friend, but a, uh, a person I used in a lot of consulting and technical work over the years. Uh, as Susan mentioned, I have a little consulting business that um, I started in uh, about 2002, and it went dormant when I went to uh, Gaffney Klein and Baker Hughes. And now I'm also uh, uh, working with Petro.ia, one of the data analytics firms that um, will not be able to get a chance to talk about them much today, but uh, I'm really enjoying, you know, sort of back in the consulting world. So today we're going to go through um, several things and we won't go into the depth that we do in the course, but I hope that most of you believe that the energy transition is real and necessary. When I look at the poll questions, normally as SPE president, when I went out and I would ask questions like, like that, I would say, you know, how many of you believe that anthropomorphic CO2 emissions are significant contributors to climate change and that the impacts of that will be real and measurable over the course of the next 30 and 40 years. Uh, in audiences that had a lot of people that were uh, more senior, I got pretty negative responses to that. Uh, in younger audiences, I got largely positive audiences. When I started um, into looking at climate change issues and CO2 emissions and the energy transition, I actually was fairly um, pessimistic about the accuracy and credibility of some of the claims. I've spent a lot of time talking with climate scientists and meteorologists and others, and all their, you know, we'll go in, we go into the models and to the evidence there. There's no question, and by what we mean by this energy transition, we're really talking about replacing fossil fuels with renewables. Now, nobody thinks that that's going to happen a week from Thursday, but the timing for how long oil and gas will remain relevant is a function of how we, as earth science uh, professionals and petroleum engineers, are able to improve the sustainability of oil and gas, how well we are able to uh, make those steps that will enable climate, uh, you know, carbon capture, how, how well we'll be able to get rid of coal. And in the course of not just decades, but very shortly, the number and types of jobs in our industry will continue to change substantially. So, uh, I, sorry about that. Uh, we won't go into this too much detail. There is confusion sometimes about weather changes versus climate change. So weather is simply the instantaneous state of the atmosphere. Temperature, humidity, et cetera, how much rain. Uh, it's driven principally by the amount of solar energy we receive. And that of course is seasonal and daily. And uh, that's a very complex function of uh, all sorts of variables. Um, and some of these variables combine to generate some extreme weather events. And those extreme weather events, you know, we're all very familiar with them. Uh, in Houston, we get, uh, we get almost all of them. Uh, so uh, uh, we just recently had an extreme weather event just a little under just a little over a month ago. I have a picture here of the February 15th uh, snowstorm, not in Houston, but in Juarez, Mexico, where uh, low temperature records dating to 1895 were shattered. We all, you know, we knew how cold this was. So this, these events are weather. Climate is simply the long-term average of weather. And it's measured in decades. And we look back, uh, you know, climate has changed radically over the Earth's history. If you look back in our 
recent history, this sort of area I've circled in the lower red, you can see that if you look back to just uh, 20,000 years ago, which for geologists, this is like yesterday, and but 20,000 years ago, uh, we had sheets of ice covering New York that were 1,000 feet or more. We're, these are enormous, and it was only in the last 10,000 years around the planet that temperatures got high enough and stable enough that people could stay in one spot, it was warm enough to develop agriculture, and we've had a very long uh, warm period, uh, and you can, you can see on the graph to the lower right, the Earth doesn't have very many of these flat spots in it at a given warm period. So you, we've got some flat spots at some really cold periods, but it's only really been pretty recently that we've had this excellent time period. Now you go back 20,000 years ago, sea levels were hundreds of feet, over 300 feet lower than they are today. If you go back to the Cretaceous, where the sea levels were hundreds of feet higher than current sea levels, you know, the kind of extreme weather events you would have had then were much higher. You know how a hurricane uh, it's in, intensifies the longer it stays out over the Gulf of Mexico and the warmer the waters. Well, these were, you know, sometimes very warm waters and they had a chance to stay on, you know, the what was the Gulf of Mexico ran right up through the U.S. And you could see the geologic record of these impact of some very huge storms uh, during that time period. So uh, obviously climate has changed radically over time. There's a lot of variables involved and CO2 concentration, as you see in the upper uh, graph on the right, it's only one of them. And you see some general correlations though with high levels of CO2 and higher temperatures. Uh, there have been a number of times in the Earth's history where CO2 concentrations are far below what we call pre-industrial, the sort of 1750 and earlier levels. And those tended to be some very cold periods in the Earth's history. We're, we're not gonna really get a chance. I, had, I originally had a bunch of slides. I started out with a, over a hundred slides for today's talk, we can't get there. Um, we're, we're gonna go across some of these in the, in the course, but, uh, the impact of climate change on the economy, the kind of models, how you can deal with climate change other than reductions in emissions. There's a lot of issues and opportunities and a lot of jobs in the future associated with these changes. Now, I will go into a couple more details here. Uh, so CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use prior to 1750 were essentially zero when the first industrial use of the coal. And for the next century, coal use uh, was really quite limited outside of a small part of Europe. And it, it only started growing over the next century. And by uh, early that next century, we had started using oil and gas. And there's a real inflection point you see here at about 1950. And you see that CO2 emissions start rising rapidly from these pre-industrial levels of about 260 ppm to current levels that are uh, over 400 ppm. And atmospheric CO2, that's the uh, blue line, that's, that's where the CO2 emissions are. So, the, sorry, the CO2 uh, concentrations, the atmosphere. The total emissions uh, uh, rose from something like, uh, five gigatons uh, annually to, you know, currently close to 40 gigatons annually uh, from fossil fuel use. And that that use, that 40 gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions, uh, that's a slope that we really want to keep in mind because we have to kind of reduce the slope of this curve, uh, this orange curve rather dramatically to make any impact. Now, Coincidentally, the world population also grew very rapidly during these time periods. Um, we just covered, we just went over about a billion people in 1800, and we didn't get to two billion people until 1925. And it was right about 1950 that we also had this 
increase in the rate of population growth. And really that's the, it's the 1950s, it's 1960s that had the modern agricultural revolution where we had uh, widespread irrigation, developed genetic variations in uh, seeds that, that were high yields and required uh, a lot of chemicals. They required fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, but most of all, they required high levels of fertilization. And then they were large farms that had to be transported great distances to feed people. So all of those things, transportation, the herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, most importantly, of course, the uh, fertilizers and the irrigation, all of those required fossil fuels. And so not only did the world population drive more CO2 emissions, but it was fossil fuel use that enabled that population growth to happen. And if you look at that slope, you can see that the rate of CO2 emissions is a higher slope than the population growth. And so from about 1900, we used about one ton, we emitted about one ton of CO2 per person per year. That number is now about five tons. It varies quite radically around the world. And it's not the per capita number that matters the most, it's the total. Because once CO2 goes in the atmosphere, it doesn't know where it came from. Mongolia has a very high CO2 per capita emission, but reducing Mongolia emissions to zero is not the world's priority because Mongolia's entire population would be about the 40th largest city in China. Okay, so uh, you really need to believe that the total CO2 emissions, and clearly China has the largest CO2 emissions by country from about 2000 to close to 2015, they were building one new coal fired power plant per week over 50 a year. India has been growing. Since about 2005, the US and Europe have been decreasing CO2 emissions. The US almost exclusive driver of that because their US total energy use has been growing since 2005. Uh, that's been driven by displacement of coal fired power plants with natural gas. So growing coal usage in China and India and decreasing in the US and Europe, uh, not nearly enough to decrease uh, the total. Total CO2 emissions are still rising. And um, so I, I will say before we go too far, uh, I'm primarily gonna be talking about CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use. And that's the largest single source of CO2 emissions. The next two big ones are, are land use changes, which include deforestation. That's 10 to 15% of the total. And another 12% or so that's from agriculture and livestock, driven by uh, production of meat, manure management, uh, production of uh, agriculture. That's, that's another very large segment. Uh, past those three, you get to some pretty small segments. So uh, now remember we talked about this uh, slope of about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. Uh, this is on the y-axis, cumulative CO2 equivalent emissions uh, as a function of time. And you can see that at 2022, we're about 2.4 gigatons. And this is uh, since, you know, 1750. And if you continue on that slope at a, just under 40 gigatons per year, you can see that very quickly we reach, uh, you know, 3,000, 4,000 gigatons total. The red bands uh, show in these models uh, probabilistic estimates. So the bottom end of the red band says, if you have a cumulative CO2 emissions of this amount, you have a 90% chance at staying below two degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures. And the top of that band is a 66% chance that you can stay below that. Same thing for the three degree C. Now, <clears throat> models vary considerably what the impact of two and three degree C are. 
tutory C has a very widespread impact on, on low-lying areas and several and on a lot of uh, storm surges and lots of things that would affect Houston, um, but uh, would really affect uh, a number of other places much worse. Uh, there are people who argue we'll be able to live with two degrees. Uh, almost all of the models that show this three degree number, this is fairly disastrous type impacts for a large part of the world. So uh, the point of this slope, this graph though, is if we were able to decrease that 40 gigatons per year by about 4% per year, we could reasonably uh, have a decent chance of staying below two degrees C. We have to get to stay comfortably below one and a half degrees C uh, uh, by 2080 or so, we would have to reduce it more sharply, obviously. And there are a number of variables in this. Okay, so on the top of this axis is sort of the remaining carbon budget. And you just divide that by 40, and that gives you sort of years of current emissions on that bottom graph. And these are a series of people's estimates. In this particular case, instead of 66% below uh, two degrees, it's 50% chance less than one and a half degrees. And you see the kind of variability in the models. But if you look at the, the range here, it's not that big. Uh, really, the question is, you know, do we get there in 10 or 20 years? It's not a matter of whether, it's how long. There are also big questions about how much impact carbon taxes and pricing will have. All of these things that are model functions, there is some variability in questions. There's just no disagreement on this among uh, serious scientists in terms of weather. Okay, so um, uh, I wanna talk to you about things I think will change and be important. To me, one of the biggest changes we've had in the last uh, you know, 20 years has been the emergence of unconventionals. This is uh, the, the amount of natural gas that we've added to our war chest is huge. And we have a chance to exploit this in a very sustainable way. I I don't know how <clears throat> optimistic or conservative the EIA numbers are and the SARI study are. I will just tell you, I have two other consulting projects going on right now. There are very large, very serious players that are looking at spending uh, billions of dollars each. And they are on shale gas basins that don't show up on this graph, okay? Um, you probably all saw this uh, many times. It's one of the most reproduced uh, figures of the last 20 years. Uh, every single one of these basins was tested, and it turns out a lot of them were unsuccessful. But the, if you look at what's been successful today and you look at just the impact of these, and I, and I want to point out that the Barnett doesn't even show up in today's EIA uh, uh, numbers in terms of you know activity levels and future performance. So uh, the one that started it all um, uh, isn't even showing here. So if you look at the result of oil and gas additions from these tight oil and unconventional gas, uh, you can see that since about the middle, you know, since 2006, we're talking about adding something like 70 BCF a day. And eight million barrels a day. Tremendous numbers, huge increases. Um, we are, you know, there's some debate about how rapidly we'll get back to this eight million barrel a day range. How high will it grow? The forecasts are, are, are also quite variable, but this change has and will affect how we go about the energy recovery and the transition. We have so much more oil and so much more gas than the actual world demand now. It's, it hasn't happened for quite some time that we've been in this case, situation where the planet has a lot more productive capacity than the demand. If you look at the forecast going forward, 
all of the future gas production that's predicted, essentially all of it's going to be hydraulically fractured. Uh, and though anyone who knows me knows that I'm a big fan of hydraulic fracturing, but we're looking at long-term growth. Uh, and there are some interesting forecasts I want to share that show what the energy transition might require. So uh, a couple of years ago, BP came across a uh, came out with a forecast. Their forecast out to 2040 showed approximately, you know, growing oil production, uh, slightly flattening. Gas production was growing. Coal grew somewhat, and you can see that even over the next, uh, you know, 20 plus years, they showed the contribution to uh, the world's energy supply of fossil fuels was increasing, but the bulk of the growth was from renewables. To this year, they came out with a forecast that has three different uh, forecasts. Out to 2050, and you can see at the far right column, the business as usual case, uh, they show a significant decrease in uh, oil demand, uh, a bigger decrease in coal demand, but still, uh, and, and all of the growth being from renewables, total fossil fuels going down over that time period. But if you look at their other forecasts, the rapid decrease and the net zero case, they were talking about radical decreases in oil production, the elimination of coal and decreases in natural gas production. This is really the first time in a long time we've seen forecasts like this. Um, these kind of forecasts, of course, are global. If you look at worldwide uh, these dark blue bars are, are coal and you can see uh, the world still uses a big chunk of coal but most of it is from asia and southeast asia we're really talking about china and india at these points europe and north america have a much smaller percentage from from coal um, and uh, the only place in the world that has a huge part of their uh, power from hydro of course is uh, south america we're uh, we're going to have to have radical reductions in the coal from India and China to achieve some of these goals. I want to show you these forecasts. The we the world in January 2021, uh, January 2020, back when things were normal, uh, we had a little over 100 million barrels a day of uh, liquid fuel consumption. Uh, the uh, business as usual forecast essentially has that flat out into 2035. Now there is a bit of a change going on where that's from in the first few years of or so that's from North American unconventionals but later on that uptake has to be from uh, uh, you know the, the rest of the world. Their forecasts for the decline however show that uh, OPEC and Russia have to be responsible for most of that decline particularly in the case of uh, the rapid case. Now in the rapid and net zero cases, you know, the rapid case, we're talking about a 50% reduction in oil demand uh, by 2050. This is hard to believe. Um, similar numbers for gas consumption, uh, even in the rapid case, we're talking about decreasing to today's level of gas after a up, uh, uptick. And coal consumption has to be basically eliminated. In their rapid case, uh, even uh, India has to, in late in late stages, be getting rid of uh, coal. In the rapid cases, they're talking about India and China shutting in power plants that are essentially being built today. Um, and so, how much you believe the BP forecast? What I want to tell you, though, there are numerous policymakers in our government and in governments around the world who are looking at what it takes to drive global carbon emissions down to the Paris type numbers, well below 2C and 1.5C. And, and they all have the same kind of forecast. The emissions have to go down from these 35, 40 gigatons annually down to numbers that are 10 or less. And the only way to do that is essentially eliminating the bulk of fossil fuels. Now, uh, this is hard to hear, uh, but there, and you may not believe it's even theoretically possible. There are certainly policies that can drive this. Uh, 
Now they are, they have some serious consequences, uh, but we'll see. And, and clearly, I, I, I don't think this is likely that we're going down this path. But we do need to do some things to actually improve the emissions from our existing oil and gas production. And, and in the course of the class, we go through and detail these in terms of carbon intensity and measurements and how we reduce uh, flaring and fugitives and decrease emissions, uh, transportation, using hydrogen, uh, lots of things uh, in a lot of detail. Can't really cover them all today, but that's kind of where the, the course is built around. How do we decarbonize the existing oil and gas industry? Now, I, I want to point out to you that, you know, the kind of things that the policymakers are looking at, if you look at the bottom curve on here, it's a solid curve, World Energy Outlook 2006, it showed the forecast from in 2006 of future solar installed capacity uh, for, for in, in terms of gigawatts per year for both solar and wind. And then the revised numbers in 2008, 2010, and 2012, and so on. And every year, they had to increase those forecasts because we put $3 trillion as governments around the world into supporting research and development and subsidies for renewables. And so uh, you look at the most recent data, they're kind of on the 2017 forecast, although the future forecast for solar even exceeds the, the previous one. So we're talking about uh, a consistent history of us underestimating the ability to do renewables. Now we, we still, there's some very aggressive numbers built into those BP forecasts. Very hard to believe that we'll be able to do the renewable growth uh, that's required to make those happen. Uh, the, the good news for us though is uh, we probably can make that complete dent in coal if there was policies that forced India and China to import LNG and, and, uh, and I believe they could do so at a very reasonable price. If you look on the right hand here, you see the CO2 emissions for the United States, clearly the largest reduction of any country, uh, larger than the EU reductions in total. Those CO2 emissions started dropping uh, about 2005 um, when the Barnett gas started exploding and we started getting reasonably cheap prices for gas. People really went to gas and shut in coal. And so we have the potential to essentially eliminate North American coal production. Uh, uh, Europe is going to be behind us in that because they, uh, several of the countries, Germany particularly, uh, shut in a lot of nuclear plants and had to build new coal-fired plants uh, to, to make up for it. Uh, so I want to talk about this coal a little bit more. Here's the U.S. coal production since about 1850. Um, Professor Tony Kovchak at Stanford has a forecast just based on this 1856 to 2008 data. So back in 1856, uh, you know, we didn't make any coal, but all of a sudden, you know, we discovered this is what's going to drive America. And for many years, that's the energy source that, that we really relied on. And the kind of forecast that was made there, just a gigantic number. The reality, of course, once we had unconventional gas, was this dramatic reduction. And over on the right-hand side, you see how much CO2 emissions we avoided by going to this black curve instead of the red curve. And if you look at you know, 2020, it's not a huge number. You look out to 2040, all of a sudden, it looks like avoidance of about 40 gigatons or about, uh, two gigatons per year. It's two gigatons per year avoided a huge number with carbon capture and storage, which we really is not in place. That number could have been more like two and a half gigatons per year. So uh, the growth in coal is going to be in the undeveloped, undeveloped countries and the non-OECD countries and the developing world. 
Uh, it's hard to call China a developing country. Uh, they're a very modern uh, country in terms of their industrial capabilities. They have uh, uh, a huge amount of coal. Almost nobody really thinks that nations will act against their own best interests. So we'll talk about some of the policy issues and things that can be done to uh, displace coal. It doesn't take that large of a carbon tax to make existing coal uh, plants be non-competitive with imported LNG even. So now I want to hit a couple things quickly. Anyone, you've, any of you have heard me talk over the last uh, 10 years have, have heard me say this. Every measure of quality of life correlates with energy use, where there's GDP per capita, access to clean water, access to electricity, literacy rates, access to education, every single one of them. And here we have gross national income uh, versus annual per capita use uh, of electricity. And so uh, you can see the bulk of the world's population growth as we go from, you know, seven, over seven and a half billion people to over nine billion people over the next 20 something years. Uh, the bulk of the world's population is going to be in the lower left hand of this uh, graph. And they are all going to want to have higher per capita incomes and higher quality of lives and use more energy per person. So we're going to have to generate a lot more clean, sustainable energy. And it turns out that uh, this issue of energy poverty is a huge one for a substantial part of our planet. There are over a billion people in the world that don't have electricity. It turns out that this number is down considerably from 2000. Uh, it's down principally in China. Uh, it has grown continually, continuing to grow uh, principally in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so uh, getting electricity to the parts of the world that need it is really difficult. Um, a lot of the world continues to use uh, wood, animal, dung, crop waste. Uh, there are, the World Health Organization identified air pollution as the number one cause of avoidable deaths, the bulk of it from indoor air pollution. Uh, most of the children's death, uh, zero to five years, the number we call uh, child mortality rates, is due to pneumonia from inhaling this soot. And so that's more than malaria, HIV, and AIDS put together. So one in eight global deaths associated with air pollution. It's a, it's a huge, huge factor. And the, this gathering of uh, animal waste and crop waste uh, for, uh, you know, to provide for heating and cooking, it, the burden falls primarily on women and children. They lack educational opportunities. They get more injured. There's uh, more chances of, uh, you know, a, a huge amount of problems with, with this. So uh, in terms of improving quality of life, providing a safe, affordable thermal fuel is extremely important. Uh, the number of people that don't have access to a clean thermal fuel uh, is now almost 3 billion. That number again has risen both in China and India, uh, been decreasing somewhat. And it since 2000, we have not made a dent in this number. This is really a sort of the planetary embarrassment as far as I'm concerned. Now, I, I, I'm, I want to go on um, again, this other part of the class, we'll talk about hydrogen, gray, blue, and green hydrogen. As some of you uh, say hydrogen, I thought hydrogen didn't have a color. Well, uh, how we make hydrogen, what, is this a realistic uh, part of our solution? Well, the good part of uh, hydrogen is that blue hydrogen, the ability for us to take methane, and make hydrogen, couple that with carbon capture and storage, we can essentially make a near zero uh, CO2 emissions uh, energy source from methane. So this is really an important opportunity for us. Um, we'll, we'll go into the how that's used um, and uh, take a real deep dive into carbon capture and storage. We'll talk about that a little bit now. Uh, the, the issues in carbon capture and storage are tremendous. 
first off, there are, there are really three things that have to happen to achieve these goals of the energy, this two degree scenario in, in Dejan New Paris. Uh, one is a massive change from fossil fuels to uh, renewables. Another one is a gigantic increase in carbon capture and storage. And the third is a tremendous increase in efficiencies. And none of those by themselves will do it. They all have to be done and they all have to be done at huge, huge scales. The forecast for carbon capture and storage to achieve this two degree scenario is, just to put this in scale, remember we were talking about the avoided uh, CO2 by uh, switching from coal to gas, that was something like two gigatons per year. We're looking at it by 2050 having to uh, store five gigatons per year. Today, we store about 30 megatons per year. The impact of 30 megatons per year is less than the impact of changing all the pneumatic actuators in South America to electric actuators. It's a very small change and is not noticeable on, at the global scale in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, however, if you look at the, the scale here, by 20, mid 2030s, we're looking at needing to uh, capture three and a half gigatons per year. Now, you probably don't relate to gigatons of CO2 very well, but in terms of volumes, subsurface, that's roughly equivalent to the current global oil production of about 30 billion barrels per year. So we would need to put into underground about 30 billion barrels per year, amazing number, and twice that. And so the capital required to achieve these goals are comparable to the total capital that's been invested in the oil and gas industry. It's huge and the, the types of jobs are the kind of jobs that we know how to do as, as engineers and earth scientists. There are really only about four major ways to do geologic storage. The first two into depleted oil and gas reservoirs and CO2 for EOR, and even the fourth one, CO2 for EOR and coal bed, are all things that are in our bailiwick. Deep saline formation injection uh, has large volume targets, both offshore and onshore, and still we would need you know, geologists to do the reservoir characterization, geomechanics people to look at the cap rock seals, uh, huge uh, amount of engineering involved. Now, the reality is to do saline storage, we're talking about a very long time period with trillions of dollars, a question about the ability to get the social license to operate. Um, and the geologic challenge, of course, uh, is, poor characterization we have of many of these deep saline formations, and the fact that the pore space is already occupied, which means we're going to have really quite high pressures involved. And so the social license operator is going to make it very difficult to do any of this in large onshore uh, formations. Also is making it different so far in offshore. Uh, if you look though at, you know, sort of the graph on the left shows you where the oil fields in the U.S. are and Graph on the right shows you where the CO2 sources are. There's plenty of CO2 sources that are not far from oil fields. We have a lot of partially depleted oil fields. Um, we really know how to do this injection. It's really the only realistic path to get to the volumes we're talking about in the next 20 years. Maybe over the next 40, the saline aquifer should take over. But the fact is, we take out about a, every year about the amount of volume we need to inject. So the real question is, can, can we make this a viable business? Can, and, and you know, so far in the US, we have this 45Q tax credit, we, which we do kind of a deep dive in in the course. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for it. I will tell you that it is not even remotely large enough to achieve the goals that I threw up in that graph, okay? There, it can do a lot more than we have today, but there is no chance that tax credits at the level of 45Q will be sufficient. We're probably looking at numbers that need to be about three times larger, and then we could talk about some really measurable impact. Um, there are other things we need to do in the net in the energy transition. One of the most important ones is to decrease methane emissions. 
And there's a lot of uh, things involved here in terms of leak detection and repair, the use of drones and fixed land-based uh, monitoring, uh, coupled with satellite and other aerial uh, things. We're talking about some, some opportunities to improve methane emissions. Uh, another one is improving flare efficiencies. Uh, a lot of flares are not nearly as efficient as I used to think. Um, and we also need to look at being able to quantify the amount of carbon intensity. So carbon intensity is the CO2 equivalent emissions per unit of energy. Now we, we usually look at this sort of wells to refinery. How much emissions do we have from the wells to where we deliver oil to the refinery? And some people look at sort of this refinery to wheels. How much, once we've got a barrel of oil, how much do we look at? Uh, we tend to use life cycle analysis studies for these. Uh, we need to be using more measurements. Uh, we need to be incorporating big data analysis into helping us understand, because we make a lot of measurements and we have a chance to really optimize things. There's uh, several projects underway to do this. There are some uh, reporting practices among companies that are highly variable. Uh, nobody's really reporting reserve-based things. I think SBE has a big role there. Um, and you know there are some issues on comparing emissions and uh, to regulatory pressures. And I want to talk about those just briefly. Um, uh, here is the wells to refinery emissions by country. So the, the numbers, I don't know how well you can read the numbers in the country. Those numbers under like USA of 824, those are the total uh, uh, scale of emissions. These are grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. This is how much CO2 equivalent emissions there is per unit of energy. And you see that Venezuela with a lot of thermal recovery, a lot of flaring, um, has very high uh, carbon intensity. There's a lot of carbon generated. Uh, similar numbers in countries that flare a lot, uh, countries that have require some diluents to uh, uh, produce the oil like Canada. Uh, some of the numbers, uh, you know, Russia looks like it has a, a relatively low per barrel, essentially. You could, instead of CO2 equivalent per megajoule, you could do uh, kilograms per barrel if you wish. And, but the grand totals are quite high. And if you go dig into what causes these, the life cycle analysis approach, we measure and monitor, you know, something 50 to 100 variables to calculate all these things. And you see the, the biggest ones is venting, flaring, and fugitives in the red bar. And in a few countries, there are some other ones that are really quite significant. We need to be able to be forecasting these on reserves and prioritizing our reserves. I do want to you know, point out that flaring is really the largest one. If you look at the absolute amount of flaring going on, uh, you know, Russia is sort of the largest flaring group. Um, and I, I want to close up for questions here. This time is flying. Um, and talk about these CO2 equivalent emissions per barrel for just a minute. Um, so from wells to refinery, which is those kind of numbers I was showing you, although the units were uh, CO2 uh, uh, grams per megajoule, um, it's about 100 kilograms per barrel to produce, transport uh, a barrel of oil. Now that varies widely, and that number can be as low as 20 and can be three or 400. But in aggregate, and really North America uh, unconventionals, that's a pretty good approximate number of about 100 kilograms per barrel. So but refineries to wheels, once you've got that barrel of oil, it turns out a barrel of oil, whether it's 30 gravity or 40 gravity or 20 gravity, they have about the same number of carbon atoms in them. And how they're used, um, you know, varies a little bit, how much asphalt, how much plastics, but a lot of it's consumed and burnt. Uh, the 400 number is basically if you burn everything, and the 340 is probably trying to take into account how much gets burned and how much is, is solid products. So this is the kind of range of, you know, refinery to wheels. Uh, so all in all, 
Uh, now, remember, a barrel of oil only weighs about 135 kilograms. It, uh, uh, CO2 weighs a lot more than uh, a C atom. Uh, the oxygen that's in there, all, both those molecules each weigh more than an individual carbon. And that's the reason we get so much CO2 emissions from uh, each barrel of oil. Now, if you look at this, uh, the implications for policymakers. We have a lot of things that we can do to decrease that 100 to 50 or maybe even 40. But they're looking at trying to make forecasts like this that say, hey, every barrel I replace, even if you cleaned it up to 50, I'm replacing 450 kilograms of CO2, whereas all that you do to clean one up is only 50. So I can remove nine or 10 times as much CO2 by eliminating oil production than I can by cleaning it up. So we've got a lot of issues here that we're going to need to address uh, to try to keep us as sustainable as possible. But there are going to be serious pressures on oil production in particular, and to a lesser extent, natural gas production. And in natural gas production, we're going to have to make sure that we have almost no fugitive methane emissions, uh, which is a problem today. So I I uh, want to go ahead and, and switch over and have an opportunity to answer a few questions. I assume we have some questions uh, coming in. We and do. I will, I will uh, switch out of the uh, the screen sharing mode great and uh, so, so I first question okay uh, first question can you please show the correlation between the co2 emissions and the global temperature change over the last 400 years um well i I've, I've got those those uh the graphs and again the uh uh but i will just drop to the answer there's not much that uh, here, let me sh let me show you. Um, I'll, I'll let me go back to sharing. Most screen. of the change is recent. Yeah, most of the change is recent. Um, uh, the bulk of the change, in fact, um, if you go if you go back and look, so 400 years ago, remember we're talking about 1600, and so there were no fossil fuel usage uh, then. Uh, there, uh, and the temperature changes were not were not high. So we really have decent recorded temperatures over that time period as well. I, I will point out one thing about temperatures, um, and we'll go into this in class, but there is no place where you know we measure the average temperature of the planet. What's actually done is we measure a lot of different places compared to a reference temperature at a given time. And some, sometimes that reference temperature is actually the average of temperatures over a period of time. And so um, there are some of the measures that are uh, indicators of climate change that are, you know, we have really good numbers back to a long time, you know, at least the last five, six, seven hundred years, maybe a thousand years, including you know, glacial extent. You know, we understand glacial extent back to Middle Ages. There are some really good numbers about it. Maybe not as good as we've had in the past couple hundred years, but we certainly don't have temperatures around the planet for much more than that. Sea level rise. Uh, sea level is difficult to measure because of the coupling with subsidence, but it's only really been uh, since satellite measurements have been in place that we've really got a good handle on sea level rise. And sure enough, there's a very consistent sea level rise of about three millimeters per year. And now three millimeters per year doesn't sound like a lot. It's it's about three centimeters per decade, which is a little over an inch per decade. Um, so out to 2100, you're talking about 10 inches or so at the low end of the estimates. A lot of people's forecasts have accelerating sea level rise and they might have as much as 30 inches rise well even 10 inches rise we're talking about again that's by 2100 i'm not going to be around in 2100 and in fact most of our audience won't be around in 2100 <laughs> uh, so uh 
10 inches. So sea level rise itself is not something that we're going to see so much that you can go out to Galveston and see it. You know, and that's that's a small part of the total planet's ice that melts to get you 10 inches. If you melted all the ice on Earth, it would be 200 feet. So a lot of these variables, we we they're they're really complicated. And I love I love the question because uh, it, we dig into some of them, and you see some of this stuff is pretty subtle, and a lot of these changes have really been recent. And like like the temperature changes, land changes have a different slope than water changes. And and there's a real noisy data that goes back about 100 years, and it's only about 1960 that you start to see the slope change, that you start to see these increases. So the, the increases have been in my lifetime. Next question. How do you think the small LNG will help the energy transfer trend? Small scale LNG? Yes. Okay, uh, well, great. So, so LNG plants are, you know, one of my very favorite things. Uh, I really am optimistic about the technology associated with LNG. I'm a, a big supporter, uh, and and uh, I'm, a, I'm excited about FLNG. I'm particularly excited about floating regas, so that we have a chance for almost all these places that are burning diesel to replace that with uh, LNG. So these small scale LNG plants, the real advantage to them, because their efficiencies are not as high as large scale LNG plants, their cost per you know, MMBTU is also higher typically. They are enabling us to commercialize and, and, and make natural gas into a good product in a lot of places where it just couldn't be developed. Some places where it could be flared, some others. Where the, if you look at the big flaring issues though, around the world, the big countries where they're flaring, uh, small scale LNG is not going to affect that. Russia is not going to make a bunch of small scale LNG plants. They've got gigascale LNG plants. And in fact, they have the lowest CO2 emissions per MMBTU uh, 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 plants, not because they, do, you know, they're uh, enviro friendly, it's because it's a lot colder. And the main driver to how efficient a plant is is how cold it is temperature so, yeah, yeah and so but these small scale plants are really an economic uh factor and they're going to enable gas development and enable gas to be used efficiently uh, and enable us to incrementally displace some uh, a fair amount of diesel and a lot of uh coal ideally depending upon what happens in india and china Next question. Any idea how to measure emissions per well and do old conventional stripper wells produce emissions and are they harmful to the environment and how to know oh, are they harmful to the you environment? Know, I, I don't know. I could have paid somebody this. I'm, I'm, but, uh, but in fact, that's what I'm, I'm doing with Petro.app. So that's one of the things I'm doing there is uh, collaborating with them to quantify those emissions. And if you look at the other kind of tools that are going on, there's there's some great technical tools that allow us to actually measure inexpensively CO2 emissions. Now, people are going to uh, take some aerial tools and some mobile tools, truck mounted tools, to find the biggest hotspots and go for the the ones first. Now, the if you said so, one of the parts of that question was, do these old stripper worlds emit uh, emissions? Yes, they do. Uh, Almost all of them have pneumatic actuators and they have artificial lift uh, units and they, a lot of them will burn uh, natural gas for that and have uh, a lot of the gas that's produced if it's if they have volumes that are that are being sold uh, need compression. So in fact, the carbon intensity of old stripper wells is higher than they were probably earlier in their field. So the per barrel they're generating more CO2 the absolute amount of CO2 is down. So, uh, so it, it typically as fields mature, the total amount goes down, but the per barrel goes up. And that's particularly true, obviously, in fields that produce increasing volumes of water. So you'd have to use uh, more energy to do the artificial lift. And, and at some point you're just lifting lots of water uh, so you have the CO2 emissions associated with that, but very few barrels. Uh, 
So, so yes, and and I think there are going to be variability there, and I think there are going to be companies that are very good at cleaning those up. When carbon intensity is a really measured, consistent thing on reserves, I think people who are good at cleaning them up are going to have opportunities to buy them from people that want to improve their numbers, uh, uh, or maybe who aren't good at cleaning them. The next question is related to tax credits. Uh, what would be the impact if a tax credit like the 45Q was split between credits for capture and for storage? Uh, well, you can actually split them that way if you there there's there's an opportunity there. The recent IRS uh, in, uh, ruling improved your ability to reallocate where the credits go. That was one of the real big questions we we had. You know. There are some companies that really benefit from tax credits, and they're the they're the ones that, uh, I, in an ideal total system, get the credits. So companies that really want to get the credits uh, are ought to be some of the capital sources for this. And so the ability to do that actually happens. Now I I will tell you, and you know, I won't go off into all my reasons now, but there are some of the carbon capture. Uh, Things that I, that are not very good, direct air capture. I mean, I I know that we have, uh, you know, some of my favorite people in Houston uh, have a company that has invested a lot of money in it. Uh, I just think it's it's doomed to failure. Uh, but uh, most of the carbon capture we're talking about is from uh, emissions from uh, you know, engines and burners and et cetera, and industrial processes. And if you if you want to be smart about this, that carbon capture ought to be the highest concentration CO2. It's the lower the concentration, the harder it is to capture CO2. And in uh, in a out coming out of a compressor, depending on how hot and how old it is, you you might be looking at numbers that are 12 percent, 15, 20 percent CO2. But you know. 15% is 150,000 parts per million. It's 400 parts per million in the air. It's hard to get you know, captured in the air. It's really easy to get out of the tailpipe. But if you are look at the gray hydrogen facilities, so in the petrochemical plants and, uh, and refineries that make using uh, steam methane reforming or auto, uh, thermal reforming, make hydrogen for ammonia and methanol and other petrochemical uh, uses, uh, they vent their CO2. And that comes out at 35, 40 plus percent CO2. Um, and in uh, the places in the world that generate uh, gas from coal, um, uh, these have tailpipes that are 85 percent CO2. So we ought to be, we, you ought to prioritize the volume and concentration. How, how easy is it to get and how much can you get in total? And so the carbon capture and storage actually has a, the 45Q actually kind of has a mismatch. It doesn't really, um, it, it, it's sort of thrown out there for people to pursue. It's not coupled with a policy that says we need to reduce uh, sort of on a creaming curve. Here's our biggest problems. Let's go after them and incentivize Focus those. on most impact. Yeah. And in fact, it's been right. modified so that you can get this tax credit, uh, a portion of the tax credit, even when you produce CO2 from wells and reinject it in storage. Now, uh, so another that was question all, about that was question. All right, go ahead. Another question about carbon sequestration. Do you think? Um, there's a risk of induced seismicity similar to wastewater injection for causing earthquakes with carbon sequestration. Okay, a really great question. And uh, the answer is, well, probably if you got high enough pressures, um, there is at least that potential. There, there have been a number of monitoring of CO2 uh, project so far really hasn't been an issue. Uh, it's nobody really is trying to go up at those steel pressures. Um, and, you know, you're because if you're going to get paid to inject CO2, uh, 
you're going to have to ultimately prove that it stays where you said it went. Okay, so uh, people are there's going to be some requirements for monitoring. Another big opportunity for petroleum engineers, by the way, <laughs> both in terms of models and uh, uh, fiber optics and everything else. But because of that, the designs have typically uh, made sure that we stay sort of well below those. Almost all those cases where you know water injection has caused lots of seismicity have been super high rates injecting into fractured basement rock. Um, as and so you know that's what the Oklahoma, South Kansas type things are. Huge, uh, you know, big faults. No one would ever consider those for CO2 storage because well they. You know, Giant faults that go miles, that, that's not where, where you want because CO2 is not going to stay there. Plus, you, you've got to have uh, some sort of cap rock type situation to do CO2. And, and you just really don't want to press the issue. Otherwise, it's going to leak and, and it'll be de detectable. Great. I'm going to have to cut you off in the interest of time. We have had some great questions from the audience today, and we want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Later today, you will each receive a link to the recording of the webinar, an evaluation form, and a link for more information on Nathan's class on energy transition for petroleum professionals. Remember that GTW20 discount if you sign up by the end of the month. It's a live online class offered in six half-day courses, May 10th through 12th and 18th through 20th uh, in the mornings in Central Time. So thanks for joining us today. Goodbye.